Hacking is extremely prevalent in competitive Pokemon, to the point where every time a competitor's team gets released, prominent data miner Kphotix analyzes the team to show who hacks and who doesn't. Many hacking detractors blame the players who hack, saying they are lazy and they are breaking the rules. However, I don't blame the hack. I blame Game Freak. Modern Pokemon games have made many quality of life improvements, like three guaranteed perfect IVs on legendaries or much easier breeding mechanics. But when competitive Pokemon began, Game Freak made it as difficult and as time-consuming as possible to acquire perfect Pokemon legitimately. Hack checks back then didn't exist, so in order to compete on a remotely level playing field without cheating, players were expected to invest an insane amount of time grinding. This creates an imbalance between players who hack and players who play legitimately, because hacking saves so much time that could go to team planning and practicing. To prove how ridiculous this was, I'm going to recreate Ray Rizzo's World Championship winning team from 2010 without hacking. I'll be building his team from scratch on a freshly completed copy of Pokemon Soul Silver. The IVs, EVs, natures, moves, and items are all fully identical to Ray's team. I want to capture the perspective of someone just getting into VGC for the first year, and show what Game Freak viewed as acceptable insofar as team construction goes, and I'm just using his team as an example for what was a good team back then. So with that said, I'm not allowing myself to do any glitches, including cloning, duping, Hama glitching, or arbitrary code execution. I originally also wanted wanted to remove date skipping, as in moving the clock forward to access repeated one day events over and over, but unfortunately I had to abandon that concept to get this video out in a reasonable amount of time. The reason I want to remove glitches like this is I think it's important to show how much time single use TMs and single encounter legendaries add to team building in Gen 4, and Game Freak did not plan for glitches, so this is what they thought was acceptable. So what is allowed then? Well, me being mixed RNG, I'll be RNG manipulating everything that I can. In addition, because this is 2010 VGC, I can use any Gen 3 or Gen 4 games that I want, because there was no dex or mark restriction back then, so a Pokemon caught in Gen 3 is just as fair game as a Pokemon caught in Gen 4. Lastly, I will be trying to do this as fast and as efficiently as possible, so I'm going to put a timer in the corner of the video, and after every task I complete, I'll say how long it took me and add it to our total amount of time. This timer is in real time, as I've recorded literally everything I did for this video and have all the VODs. Without further ado, we start the setup. The first thing I did was get Ray Rizzo's team. I have to thank Ray himself here for this, because his team was not on the internet anywhere, and I had to ask him directly for it, and he was kind enough to post it in his Discord. So here is his team, and if you're like me, the first thing you've noticed is that there are four legendaries on it. This is a problem for a few reasons. First, not all of these legends are available in one game. In fact, the minimum amount of games you can use if you only want to do Gen 4 games is three. Platinum or Diamond for Cresselia and Dialga, Heart Gold for Kyogre, and Soul Silver for Groudon. And on top of all of this, Lotad is in the stupid Heart Gold and Soul Silver Safari Zone, which I have not learned how to properly use to this day. So I decided, okay, I'll use a Gen 4 game, Platinum, and a Gen 3 game, Emerald. This lets me easily get the two Hoenn Pokemon, Makuhita and Lotad, and also lets me get both Kyogre and Groudon. And then I can play Platinum to get Dialga and Cresselia. But no, I can't even do that. God forbid. You see, Pariyama has Low Kick on its moveset, which is only obtainable from the Heart Gold Soul Silver Battle Frontier using Battle Points. It's one of the few moves that is also not a move tutor in Platinum. Because of this, I am forced to use one of Heart Gold or Soul Silver, and I am still forced to use either Diamond or Platinum. Ultimately, I decided to go with Soul Silver, Platinum, and Emerald. I chose Soul Silver out of the two for no particular reason. I think either it or Heart Gold will do. And then I chose Platinum because it's the faster paced game compared to Diamond, and it also has some extra move tutors. And if I was also to build another VGC team in the future with Palkia, I would not have to replay another game. Lastly, I used Emerald over another Gen 4 game because it would be much quicker to complete than Heart Gold or Soul Silver. And while it is a bit longer than Ruby or Sapphire, the RNG manip to get which legend I need would be much easier in Emerald. Also, getting Lotad and Makuhita is really easy there if I'm using a Gen 3 game. This also introduces one final problem. Yeah, as a casual fan, I own Platinum and I own Emerald, but I have already beaten them. I caught all the Pokemon already for my Pokedex. So that's right. Not only am I expected to own a minimum of three games and two consoles, I have to replay two entire games just to build my team. Okay, well, there are some silver linings to this. I can plan out my playthroughs to get some extra items that would be somewhat annoying to obtain with just one game. So, in my playthrough of Platinum, I made sure to collect along my journey the TMs for Trick Room, Fling, and Grass Knot. In addition to that, I also made sure to pick up a Citrus Berry on Route 210. Now, you think that once I hit the Hall of Fame, I'd be done, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. You see, 
To RNG Cresselia and Dialga, I have to get the National decks, which I can only do by seeing every Pokémon native to Platinum's regional decks. This even means legendaries like Uxie, Mesprit, and Azelf. This is actually another reason to pick Platinum over Diamond. This is the first game in the entire series that respawns legendaries if you KO them and then you beat the Elite Four. So I could do that and then RNG these Pokémon later on if I want. With all of this done, but before I have even caught Dialga or Cresselia, we are at 7 hours and 22 minutes for my playthrough of Platinum. Then, in my journey through Emeralds, I caught a Makuhita, a female Lotad, and got an extra Earthquake TM. There weren't really any items that I could get here that wouldn't involve spending a ton of time in the battle frontier, so that was all for the extra stuff. I also briefly considered not only doing Kyogre and Emerald, but getting both Kyogre and Groudon here. But I'll talk more about that in a bit. In the end, this was a much faster pace at 3 hours and 9 minutes. Our new total time is 10 hours and 31 minutes. Now that all three games are complete, I can begin getting the stuff I need to to catch Pokemon and Eevee Train. In Soul Silver, I need to catch two Chadots to perform RNG minutes, which I do by using the Sinnoh sounds in the first floor of the Bell Tower that has encounters. They both come at the level where they already know Chatter, but this took an unfortunate 11 minutes and 12 seconds because the encounter rate was super low and also because I had to go get Ho-Oh's Feather from the guy in Pewter City. After I get the Chadots, I then cap out my Game Corner coins at 50k by RNG manipping the Voltorb Flip pattern. My friend Twisty found and brute forced the pattern on a specific RNG seed, so all I have to do is hit the proper initial seed and then only clear the 2x and 3x blocks, and after 23 minutes and 52 seconds, I have 50k coins. I know this sounds excessive, but the reason I wanted to get all 50k was because it really only adds about 10 minutes of time, but for future team building, I won't have to do as much work to get the extra rare TMs that you can only get here. With my game corner coins maxed out, I do another RNG, this time for Pokerus. Pokerus is a buff your Pokemon can have that doubles the speed of EV training, but it's a 1 in 21,845 chance to contract it, which is significantly rarer than a shiny Pokemon. So, I choose to manip it. This is actually really simple, it's just a wild RNG. You have to make sure you KO the Pokemon in one turn, and also make sure that the LC RNG is on a current PRNG state, which is one advance before a PRNG state whose 16 bit upper ends on one of the three values I'm showing on screen. I know that sounds like a lot, but there's a tool that just spits out what advance to hit, and you just just do a wild RNG. It's easy peasy. After the RNG, I make sure to spread Pokerus to a few extra Pokemon and put them in the box for later to make sure Pokerus doesn't run out and I can still spread it. This took 16 minutes and 25 seconds in total. Okay, so now that I have Pokerus, I have to get my money capped and I have to buy all the vitamins I'll need for EV training later. You can battle Gentleman Alfred between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. on a Tuesday in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and he gives you 24,000 Poke dollars per match. So I call him at 6 p.m. for a match and uh, oh, what? It's not Tuesday? Uh, okay, I'll do something else until Tuesday. I guess then? So, while I wait for it to be Tuesday, I have some prep work I need to do in Platinum as well. The first thing I gotta do is get some chatouts to perform RNG minips in this game. They're right outside of Pastoria at the proper level, so this only takes 8 minutes and 45 seconds. So, because catching Pokemon is difficult, I decide to RNG minip a second Master Ball in Platinum, so I could use one on Cresselia and then one on Dialga. This would save a lot of time in getting proper catchers up to level and all of that jazz. My friend Happy Lappy has a great spreadsheet tool which explains how to do this minip. It amounts to hitting your seed, waiting for the date and time to roll over one day, then confirming your seed with coin flips and chat up, and then talking to the group person and starting a new group. Because this was my first time ever doing it and I kept missing my seed, this took me one hour and seven minutes on the dot. Is it Tuesday yet? No. It's only been one hour and 15 minutes? <sighs> okay, well. I do have more prep work I can do in Soul Silver. So, in order to EV train appropriately, I'm going to need what are collectively known as the power items. They add 4 EVs each to the stat they represent when you KO a Pokemon, and they cost 16 BP each, a total of 96 BP. That's right, BP. So game, what you're telling me is that in order to get the items I need to EV train swiftly, I need to beat the toughest challenge in the game the battle frontier without well-trained Pokemon? Okay, so that's what I had to do. I battled in the battle tower for five hours and 10 minutes to get all the BP I needed to buy these items. Now, this game also has the battle factory, which gives five BP every seven wins instead of the three BP every seven wins the battle tower gives, and both the tower head and the factory head give 20 BP a win each, but I actually found that the battle factory was far more difficult. Because you can't control your team, there was just a lot more that could go wrong. And the Infernape I was using that was my starter in Platinum was so good, it could almost single-handedly carry me to Palmer every time. Now, I only beat him twice, but that definitely sped things up. I'm honestly shocked how long this took. It was a bit longer 
longer than doing this in white version. I would have assumed this was faster because I definitely earned BP faster, but I think it might be just because Gen 4's battle system is so sluggish compared to Gen 5. So after my adventure in the battle tower, it's the next day and it's a beautiful Tuesday morning. So I'm ready to tackle Alfred. It hits 10 and I call my guy up and I battle him for 28 minutes. This gets me to 999,999 Poké Dollars, the max amount of money the game allows you to hold. Then I go to the mall to buy my vitamins. I calculated which one I would need based on the EVs of the team and I bought them all in one go to save time and- What was this? I ran out of money before being able to afford every vitamin I would need, despite being at the money cap the game has? Are you- are you serious? Okay, it's okay. Everything's okay. So after buying what vitamins I could, I had to battle Alfred for another 10 or so minutes to be able to afford the rest of them. After a total of 41 minutes, I had all the vitamins I would need and some spare cash to boot. All of our prep work took 7 hours and 59 minutes, making our new total time 18 hours and 30 minutes. So with all of my prep done, it's time to catch some Pokemon. But while we do, I want to tackle the elephant in the room, RNG manipulation. You see, in my 2011 VGC World Championship recreation video, I got tons of comments like this. Why not just hack if you're gonna RNG? It's basically the same thing. So what I want to do with the first Pokemon I'll be capturing here, Groudon, is show you how the RNG manip works in Soul Silver to show you how it is different from a hack while also explaining to you how it works. So Game Freak uses a very old and very public algorithm called the Linear Congruential Generator in these games as their pseudo random number generator. The DS cannot produce true random, so this algorithm takes in the date, time, and number of video frames rendered by the DS since the game is launched and puts that information into the algorithm to get your initial seed. Then, once you are in the game, this RNG is moved forward every time something random needs to be checked, like an NPC moving in a random direction, a move missing, an NPC's random Pokegear dialogue, or a chat out with a custom cry getting its pitch randomly shifted. Because this algorithm is public, it was able to be reverse engineered rather quickly, with some of these RNGs being doable in the games back in 2010. The programs that I am using are equivalent to using an encyclopedia to look up information about the game, because it is only used to search. I still have to do the work of getting the Pokemon myself. As you can see in this video, my DS is not connected to my computer or anything. It's all manual verification and my reflexes. So I load up the game while listening to a timer, trying to press A at the right time. Then I check Raikou and Entei's locations to see if I hit the right seed. I did, so now I flip back and forth between my two chat out summary screens, listening to the pitch of their cry to keep track of my current RNG state. Then I talk to Groudon. The end result here is a shiny Groudon with the IVs I want, but that's it. Unlike hacking, I do not end up with a fully EV trained perfect Pokemon with all the moves it needs and the proper item, just the IVs and the nature. I hope this illustrates to you why this is completely different from hacking and it helps you follow along with the rest of the manips. This process is prone to human error and failure. It's a 1 30th of a second window to start the game up at the right time, and then I have to manually listen to Chadot's cry to tell me where I am in the RNG. This is something that you could fail at for hours if you're having an off day. As for the reason I'm RNG manipping instead of just soft resetting, well, here's the deal. This Groudon needs a 31 IV in HP, attack, defense, and special defense, and it also needs a zero in speed. All of these are a 1 in 32 chance to occur. It also needs a brave nature, which if you use a synchronizer is an additional 50-50 chance on top of those 1 in 32 chances. I won't bore you with the math, but this ends up being a 1 in 160 million chance to occur with Synchronize. Keep in mind, everybody, the odds of getting a shiny are 1 in 8,192. Now, you can get about 180 soft resets per hour in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, so to get this Groudon, you need to spend 101 years soft resetting. This, of course, is impossible, so either I get a horrible Groudon or I RNG minute. So I RNG minute. And I've got a bunch of new guides coming out featuring the manips I did in this video. So if you want to learn how to do RNG manip in Gen 4, please stick around for more and make sure to like and comment on this video. I've also got playlists on how to RNG in every single Gen 3 through 8. So if you want to check those out, links will be in the description and in a card. All in all, it only took 10 minutes to get our 4 IV zero speed brave shiny Groudon. Cresselia was my next catch. While Roamer RNG isn't particularly difficult, I just have to use the coin flip app to verify my seed and flip chat out 60-ish times. It did take about 20 minutes and 50 seconds to get our 4 IV zero speed sassy shiny Cresselia because finding and catching it took quite a while as a consequence of it being a Roamer. So after Cress, I took on Dialga. First, I had to run and get the Adamant and Lustrous Orbs. Then I had to climb to the top of Mount Coronet. After that, it was just a few coin flips and chat out flips to hit the 4 IV zero speed quiet Dialga that I wanted. In total, this took 16 minutes 
and 14 seconds. With the three legends I needed in Gen 4 caught, I think it's time to take a boat to Hoenn to catch Kyogre. This is a complex process, so let's go through step by step of how what I'm doing here in Emerald works. First, Gen 3 RNG is very similar to Gen 4 in so far as seeding goes, because it also uses a linear congruential generator. But there's two key differences. First, Emerald's initial seeding function is never called, so it always starts at zero instead of a random value based on date and time. And two, instead of the RNG only being called when it's needed, like for random NPC movement, it's just called every single time the screen draws a new frame, meaning it's updated 60 times per second since Emerald is a 60 frames per second game. Normally, this type of RNG would be very limited because the IV spreads on Seed Zero are pretty bad, but we can work around this using two things. First, the battle record feature on the Frontier Trainer Pass, and second, the paintings of the latest winner in the Lily Cove Contest Hall. First, I'll head to the Frontier to get the proper trainer card. Then, I need to catch an Oddish with Sweet Scent. After after that, I head to Lily Cove Contest Hall and save in front of one of the paintings. Talking to this painting causes the RNG to be reseeded by how many video frames have been rendered since the game's last reset, which means if we talk to it precisely, we can get whatever initial seed we want just by waiting. So I use a timer to hit the right initial seed, which I can verify by catching a Pokemon and checking its IVs, then I immediately go to the Battle Factory and lose a match and save a battle record of that losing match. This battle record is a replay of the last match you saved to it, but instead of keeping an actual video of that match, the game just saves inputs and RNG states, so if you open it, it will reset the RNG to what it was when you saved the record, which means you can store the seed you just hit using the painting. Now, I'm only 7.3 minutes away from my Kyogre. I know what you're thinking, 7.3 minutes? That's such a long wait. Well, if I had used the normal Emerald Broken RNG seed, it would take 483 days. So, yeah, I think I'll take the 7.3 minutes. After making a new battle record and waiting 40 seconds each attempt, I got my 4 IV zero speed quiet Kyogre. In total, from start to finish, Kyogre took 59 minutes. In addition, I transferred Kyogre, the Lotad, and the Makuhita up via the Pal Park, and also spent some time getting a heart scale from a Love Disc so I could teach Kyogre Ice Beam via the Move Reminder. All of that took an extra 30 minutes as well. On to Lotad, my first breed. The first thing I have to do for them, though, is RNG a good parent. You see, Lotad requires the Egg Move Leech Seed, so I RNG Minip a 5 IV Hopip, which conveniently is caught at the level where it already knows Leech Seed. Then, I put the Hop and the female Lombre I caught in the daycare. Egg RNG is a two-step process. So, first I confirm my seed and generate the egg and then I save. Then I hatch it to make sure it has the right nature and ability, which it does. After that, I reset the game and RNG the IVs, which are generated when I receive the egg from the old man. After the hatch, I use the IV checker in the Battle Frontier to confirm the IVs are correct. And now I have a 5 IV shiny modest Lotad, which took a total of 43 minutes. Our last Pokemon to get is a Makuhita. The process is near identical to Lotad, except Makuhita doesn't require any special egg moves. I did still need a good parent though, so I RNG to 5 IV Ditto with a 0 in speed, and then I went to the daycare. I first First verified my seed and then generated the egg and checked to make sure it had the right ability in nature. After that, I reset and RNG'd the IVs and checked using the IV checker. Now I have my 4 IV a zero speed brave shiny Makuhita. Makuhita took a bit longer than Lotad as I was struggling to hit the seed for the IV RNG. And in total, this took me 50 minutes. All in all, it took 3 hours and 49 minutes to obtain all of our teammates. This makes our grand total so far 22 hours and 20 minutes. With all of our Pokemon caught or hatch, I think it's time for a primer in Gen 4 EV training. So, EVs are only gained two ways in Gen 4, Vitamins or Pokemon KOs. Vitamins gives 10 EVs per use and can only give 100 EVs total to any given stat. They're expensive, but overall it saves time to grind for money and then buy them. I bought all the ones I'd need earlier. Then, there's Pokemon KOs. Generally, when a Pokemon gains EXP from assisting in a Pokemon KO, it receives either 1, 2, or 3 EVs. The amount you receive is based on the species of the Pokemon that you defeated. We can enhance Pokemon KOs to give us more EVs in two different ways. First is the power item. Each power item adds 4 EVs to the stat it represents every time you gain EXP from defeating or assisting in the defeat of a Pokemon. So, for example, if you have the Power Bracer equipped and you KO Goldeen, you gain 5 EVs of attack for that KO, because Goldeen awards 1 attack EV per KO, and the Power Bracer awards 4 attack EVs per KO. The the second way we can enhance Pokemon KOs is Pokeress, which we RNG minipped earlier. This is a permanent buff your Pokemon can get that doubles the total amount of EVs received at the end of a battle, including those rewarded from the power items. So in our Goldeen example, that 5 total EVs would now be 10 total EVs because Pokeress doubled everything that we have. Lastly, I think it's important to understand my approach to EV training. I'm doing my training in Soul Silver, where I think wild battles are the fastest method. So what I do is find an area where only one Pokemon spawns for the stat that I want to train. For HP, I use the Water in Slowpoke Well, which has a 100% spawn rate for Slowpoke, who give 1 HP EV each. For attack, I use the Water on Route 25, which has a 95% chance to spawn Goldeen, and a 5% chance to spawn Sea King, who give 1 and 2 attack EVs respectively. For defense, I use Route 21, which has a 95% chance to spawn Tangela, who give 1 defense EV each. For special attack, I use Sprout Tower
Tower at night, which has an 85% chance to spawn Ghastly, who gives one special attack EV each. For special defense, I use Route 27 just outside of New Barktown while surfing. This has a 90% chance to spawn Tentacool and a 10% chance to spawn Tentacruel, who give one and two special defense EVs respectively. For speed, I use Sprout Tower in the daytime, which has a 100% chance to spawn Rattata, who yield one speed EV each. With proper areas to EV train and found, I first gave my Pokemon whatever vitamins they would need for the two stats that are going to end up being more than 100 EVs. Then, for the four legendaries, I just make sure they had moves that were good enough to KO the Pokemon they would come across, and they would do all the KOing themselves, since they were high level and relatively powerful. Then, I'd use the remaining vitamins for stats that were below 100 EVs in the end. This saved a lot of extra training and travel time. In addition, I'd use the PP of the moves I did the KOing with to keep track of how many EVs I have to get. You see, a Pokemon can have 255 EVs max in a specific stat, but the most EVs that do anything is 252. So, you can waste three EVs by accidentally miscounting or KOing too many Pokemon. So, I keep track with move PP. For example, if I have to KO 15 Goldeen with Groudon, I would use 10 Earthquakes and be at 0 PP for that move, then 5 Ancient Powers to be 0 PP in that move as well. And then I would know I had done all 15 KOs. For the two babies though, it's a bit of a different story. They're pretty weak, so I had to do what's known as switch training. I would first lead with the baby and then switch into a stronger Pokemon to actually do the KOing for them. Alright, now that you know how EV training works in Soul Silver and how I do it, let's break down what each Pokemon needed to be fully trained and how long it took. First up was Groudon, who I gave 10 HP ups and 10 proteins. Then I KO'd 16 Slowpoke, 14 Goldeen, 1 Sea King, and then I gave him 2 Zinc. This took 20 minutes. Not bad for a first training session, I think. After Groudon, I trained their cousin, Seabur the Kyogre. First, I gave them 10 HP ups and 10 Calcium. Then, I KO'd 16 Slowpoke and 16 Ghastly. Then, I gave them 2 Iron. Kyogre took the exact same amount of time as Groudon at 20 minutes. Fitting, given the rivalry that these two have. Next up is our final box art legend, Tim the Dialga. Tim follows almost the exact same gym and diet routine of Seabur, with 10 HP ups, 10 Calcium, 16 Slowpoke, and 16 Ghastly. But at the end, Tim takes 2 Zinc instead. Given the similar type of training, Tim also takes 20 minutes as well. Now for our final legend, Stardust the Cresselia. First, Stardust gets 10 HP ups and 10 Zincs. Then, I KO 16 Slowpoke, 14 Tentacool, and 1 Tentacruel. After all the KOs, I give her 1 Calcium. Stardust was surprisingly faster than the 3 box art legends, clocking in at 19 minutes. On to the first of the babies, Leg Day the Makuhita. Leg Day starts off their workout by taking 10 Proteins and 10 Zincs. Then, using Switch Training, I have my Feraligator KO 16 Goldeen, 1 Sea King, 14 Tentacool, and 1 Tentacruel. After that, he takes 1 HP up. In total, this also took 20 minutes. Honestly, I'm sort of shocked the Switch Training didn't slow things down at all. Lastly, we have Larry the Lotad. Larry takes 10 Carbos and 10 Calcium. Then, with the help of my Feraligator, KOs 16 Rattata and 16 Ghastly. After that, he takes 1 HP up to finish off his workout. Larry took about 23 minutes, slower than Leg Day, but I'm not really sure what bogged him down. Perhaps the encounter rate for Ghastly being well below 100%? I'm not really sure. All in all, EV training added 2 hours and 2 minutes to the timer, making our new total time 24 hours and 22 minutes. We've breached the 24 hour barrier, and we still have a ton of work to get done. The rules of VGC 2010 state that Pokemon from levels 1 through 50 are allowed, and that any Pokemon above that level will be brought back down to level 50. So now we have to get both Lotad and Makuhita to this level, and I also have to get Kyogre to level 80 so it can learn Water Spout. I'll also include the grind for the Water Stone to evolve the Lombre here. Unfortunately, in these games, there's no real easy way to level grind. It's basically either the Elite Four or like this one trainer with a Needle Queen, Needle King, and a Gyarados. Neither are super efficient, so we have to boost our EXP by using a Lucky Egg. Lucky Egg is found 5% of the time on Wild Chansey, so I used some RNG Manip to get that. I kept missing my seed, so this actually took a while, but eventually I confirmed I hit the seed with the Roamers, did about 40 or so chat up flips, and bam, there's a Chansey holding a Lucky Egg. I actually caught it because I don't have a Pokemon with Thief. This took me 18 minutes. Now, the trainer I would use the rematches for was called Pokemaniac Brent, and he was only available to rematch between 4am and 10am on Mondays. Luckily, I get up for 5am at work typically, so this wasn't so bad to get up an hour earlier to make time to rematch for him. Wait, it wasn't so bad? This is ridiculous that I have to do this. I love the Poke Gear. It's cool. But sometimes these time restrictions are really harsh. Anyway, this took me 20 minutes of grinding and what? Why why doesn't Kyogre have Water Spout? Oh, I see. A level 80 is for Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. It's actually level 50 in Heart, Gold, and Soul, Silver. How foolish of me not to check. Well, that was a uh, 20 minutes wasted effort, I guess. I'll have to get a hard scale to deal with this later. Moving on to Leg Day, I use the Switch Method and the Lucky Egg to continue grinding. I am hoping to get all three of these mons done before 6.30 when I have to leave for work. This took really long, like 45 minutes of Switch training long. And Leg Day at the end was never powerful.
powerful enough to take on any Pokemon on his own, even as he crept up to level 50. As I start Larry, it's about 5 a.m., and I knew I was in for another 40 plus minute grind session. I was really hoping it wouldn't be much longer than that. All in all, though, Larry took 50 minutes of switch training just to get to level 50, as we mercilessly beat up Brent. Larry was even able to KO's Brent Nido King and Nido Queen on his own eventually, so this could have taken even longer if he wasn't capable of doing that. I just finished at around 6 a.m. <sighs> what a journey. All right, so now we have to evolve this Lombre here. He needs a Water Stone, and I decided the best way for me to get this is to grind Pokathlon for Athlete's Points, since the Water Stone is available here for 2,500 points. The Pokathlon is really fun, and I'll talk about this more in a bit, because we'll be needing to do a lot of it later. But for now, just know it's a collection of minigames using the touchscreen, and after winning it five times, I was able to collect my 2,500 points and buy a Water Stone to evolve Larry. This, in total, took 45 minutes. In the end, leveling and evolving my Pokemon took 2 hours and 58 minutes, making our new total time 27 hours and 20 minutes. With the leveling and evolving done, I need to snag the items for my team. I already had the Citrus Berry for my Platinum playthrough, so I just need to acquire the Macho Bracer, the Iron Ball, the Flame Orb, the Choppel Berry, and the Life Orb. The Macho Bracer is easy. It's on a trade Machop in the Goldenrod department store. The guy just wants a Drowsy, so I go outside and catch one and give it to him to get my Machop with the Bracer that I need. This took about 4 minutes. Up next in Soul Silver is the Iron Ball, which is in Mount Mortar. I found a YouTube video of showing where it was, and I just followed that. It took about 7 minutes to run through the cave and follow the guy. There is one more item I need to get in Soul Silver, but it's a Frontier item, which is really annoying. So I'll skip it for now and move on to the two remaining items I need in Platinum. First up is the Choppleberry, which is only found 5% of the time on Wild Buniri. So I opened Pokefinder to find a seed where Buniri would have the item, and honestly, this took me forever. 20 minutes of failing to hit my seed later, I finally land it, confirm my seed with coin flips, and then catch the Buniri in a quick ball. This is what I'm talking about. Sometimes you are just having an off day and Gen 4 will kick you while you're down. This RNG could have taken me 5 minutes, but today it was 20. After that, I need to head to the outside of Mount Stark and get the life orb. It's just some overworld navigation and this takes about 6 minutes. Alright, so we finally need to tackle the flame orb, which is only 16 BP. Shouldn't be so bad, you'd think. It would take about 6 wins, assuming I win 3 every time and I never beat Nolan. And I'd have it right away if I did beat him. So I head into the tower, win round 1, and immediately lose round 2. Figures. So, I had enough, and I thought I'd give the factory a try. It does have a higher yield of points, 5 per 7 wins, so if I got lucky, things would move faster, and boy do they. Somehow on my very first try, I make it to factory head Trevor and defeat him, netting me 30 points in one go. Obviously, this is more than I need, but it will help me because I have to return here later. All in all, this took me 1 hour and 10 minutes of grinding. All things combined, the items took 1 hour and 47 minutes, almost entirely the flame orb. This makes our new total time for the challenge 29 9 hours and 7 minutes. With all our items obtained, we now need to finish getting our Pokemon their moves. This is a big ordeal in Gen 4, both because TMs, the way to just instantly teach a Pokemon a move, are not reusable, and also because there's a ton of tutor moves between Heart Gold and Soul Silver and Platinum that are not particularly quick to get. First thing I decided to do was get some shards for a move tutor in Platinum. It's by far the easiest way for Cresselia to learn Helping Hand, and it costs 2 red shards, 4 yellow shards, and 2 green shards. Now, because I had stopped to pick up most items I saw in the overworld, I actually had 3 red, 3 Three yellow and three green shards, so I only needed one shard. I had to dig for it in the underground. This took me 40 minutes just to get one single shard. This is actually a benefit somehow. I got a ton of heart scales this way, which I actually needed for some of my other Pokemon. So now that I have the requirements for the move tutor in Platinum, we'll go back to Soul Silver to purchase my remaining TMs. In Goldenrod, I buy one light screen, four protects, and two thunder TMs at the department store. Then in Goldenrod's game corner, using the 50k coins I have, I bought one flamethrower for 10k coins. And in Celadon's game corner, I bought Psychic for 10k coins. At this point, I just have to do some trading between the games to get the required TMs and move tutors and hard scale relearns on everyone that I need. I have a few things I'd like to bring to light here, though. The reason I have to be so careful and planned with all of my moves is because some of the moves on this team are extremely rare. Earthquake, Brass Knot, Fling, Dragon Pulse, and Trick. These moves are only one per game, so across my two Gen 4 games, I can only get two of these moves each. Now, technically, there are ways to get more of these attacks, but it's completely ridiculous. First is Grass Knot and Earthquake, which have a 1% chance to be acquired via pickup. My favorite part about this, the levels for pickup for these moves do not overlap. So you need either a level 71 through 90 pickup user on your team for a 1% chance at Grass Knot, or a 91 through 100 pickup user on your team for a 1% chance at Earthquake. As for purchasables, Earthquake and Dragon Pulse are both available in the Battle Frontier for 80 battle points. If we look back to the intro, 96 BP took me 5 hours. We can reason that to 
three hours per team if we want to get more of these with a more slightly optimized team. Okay, well, is there any other way to get these moves? Yeah, Earthquake, Trick Room, Fling, and Dragon Pulse are all also purchasable in Pokemon Battle Revolution, the stadium-style game for Gen 4. They are all 9,600 Poke Coupons or more. To put it into perspective for you, it took me five hours to beat the entirety of Pokemon Battle Revolution and all of its cups with a fully EV trained team, and I ended up with 5,500 Poke Coupons. So this grind is even worse than the Frontier Points. It could take literal days to get enough points for just one single TM. Lastly is Rock Slide, TM8. There is no way to get more of this. There is only one in each Gen 4 game, and no way to buy more of them anywhere. Meaning you have to replay an entire game just to get Rock Slide every time you need a new copy of it. Now, I know this can be mitigated by chain breeding, but this is a restricted format. Groudon cannot breed. Now I only have one more Rock Slide. If I need to change my team and put Rock Slide on Hariyama, I'm pretty screwed. This is why I considered catching Groudon in Emeralds and grinding BP in the Emeralds Frontier just to keep my precious Rock Slide TM around a bit longer. Well, with that, we are done. Everyone has all of their moves and we just have to, what was that? The BP tutor move? <laughs> right. The whole reason I even had to use Soul Silver at all was this, the 32 BP move tutor for low kick. This makes sense, right? It's a format with legendaries who are typically very heavy, so this would be a great move. And after having such a great run in the battle factory earlier, which gives more BP than the tower, but is a bit more difficult, I decided to use it to try and get this move. On my first run, I made it past round one and then lost at the final match of round two, effectively wasting 15 minutes. Minutes. From here, it was just a steady creep, usually making it to round two or three and sometime losing in round one. Overall, I found it to just be unbelievably inconsistent. At the end, grinding the factory, winning some, losing some, it took me about one hour and 10 minutes just to get one single move. And overall, it took me two hours and 22 minutes to get every single move onto my team. Now we broke the 30 hour mark, making 31 hours and 29 minutes our new total playtime unbelievable now that we have every move on all of our pokemon we just have to make sure all of the moves have the maximum number of pp on them this means i either have to use one pp max on every move or three pp ups on every move this is daunting because there is always a hard limit on pp maxes in every game usually not more than five and pp ups are not easily repeatable usually through pickup or some other obscure method like the lottery however this is the last benefit to using three games since i have three freshly completed pokemon games i have a total of 34 PP ups and 8 PP maxes at my disposal. So I set out to collect. Before I show you this, I do have to thank the great YouTube channel called Tarks96. I use their videos to find all the spots of the PP ups in order. This was a great help. Anyway, in Platinum, I scoured the land far and wide, taking 40 minutes to collect every single PP up and PP max. Part of the problem here was I had not done some of the post-game plot stuff in the fight area or that cave near Shaman's Path, so I kept running into galactic grunts or random trainers I'd never fought before. It really bogged the pace of this down. Next up was Soul Silver, which was a bit faster, clocking in at 30 minutes. These journeys through the overworld can take a really long time. Some of the PP ups or maxes are in super remote locations in caves, requiring tons of HMs, repels, and escape ropes to find at an efficient pace. The last game was Emerald, which would have been the fastest game of all if not for the one final PP map. You see, it's the usual run in Emerald at first, run around on various routes, caves, etc. to find PP ups. But the last PP max is the reward for the seventh puzzle in the trick house, which trying to beat this game quickly, I had done none of. So I had to do every single puzzle. This took 22 minutes on its own just to get one PP max. So Emerald also took 40 minutes to get all the PP ups, with more than half spent on one PP max. Then I transferred all of them out of Gen 3 using the Pal Park, which took another 10 minutes. All in all, the PP ups in Emerald took 50 minutes to get. The eight PP maxes will cover two entire Pokemon, and 33 of the PP ups will fully cover 11 moves. That means I only need 14 more PP ups to get. I was originally going to do the lottery and figured if I limited myself to one lotto RNG per day, that would be fair. Yeah, I'd have to date skip, but if I only did one per day, I wouldn't be winning the lotto more than expected. Then I realized I could buy them for 1,000 points at the Pokeathlon on a Tuesday or Thursday, so I got to grinding there. The Pokeathlon is a really fun collection of touchscreen based minigames. The way it works is you pick a category of competition, which would be speed, skill, power, jump, or stamina, and you compete in three minigames of that category for some points. And the the amount of points you win are rewarded to you at the end of a competition. Each Pokemon also has unique athlete stats, meaning a Pokemon can be good at some games or bad at others. For example, flying Pokemon tend to be good at the jump skill. The games are otherwise fully skill based, which means you just have to get really good at them. Lastly, if you win a competition, you get 100 points as a bonus. And this was the key for me. You see, I found that I was very good at both the jump and speed minigames, and I could consistently get 400 points during the actual competition.
competition. And because 400 plus points were always enough to win, that means I would have 500 plus points per win because of the 100 point bonus. And at 500 points a win, with the PP ups costing 1,000 athlete points, I'd have to win 28 times to get enough points. So I booted up my live stream and I went to work. I'm the best at speed, so I did that for a long while. Eventually, I switched to jump because it's easier on my hands, although I'm a bit worse at it and I find it a bit less fun. In the end, it only took me 27 wins instead of 28 because of the extra points I won every time. The total amount of time this took was one hour and 30 minutes. And then I went to cash in my athletes points for the rewards. What? You can only buy one per day. This devastated me. And if I had done my research a bit better, I would have known this. All Pokathlon items are only once per day purchases. And PP ups can only be bought on Tuesdays or Thursdays. 14 of these would have taken me seven weeks to buy, even though I already had the points. Unwilling to delay the video that long and also unwilling to grind another way to get PP ups, I decided to break my rules on the date skip and buy multiple of them in one day. All I had to do was set the clock to 23.59 on a Monday night, load the game up and wait till it hit midnight on Tuesday. Then I could buy a PP up and I would save and reset and do it again. This took me 15 minutes. Now that I'm in the home stretch, I just have to use all the PP ups and PP maxes. This takes 15 minutes to do, in no small part because I have to trade to platinum and use the ones that I have over there. Now that all the PP ups are done, this whole saga took 4 hours and 10 minutes just to make sure my moves had enough power points to compete. Ridiculous. All in all, this whole saga took me a total of 35 hours and 39 minutes. Truly an unbelievable amount of time to build it. I once again kept a secret from you all. Both my Capture DS and my DS Lite have a mod chip installed that let me overclock my DS. I can and have been playing these games, even the GBA ones, nearly the entire time at 1.7 times the speed normally possible. This means this would have taken me 60 hours and 36 minutes if I was playing on unmodified consoles. Unreal. This is unreal. I'll be honest. This took me much longer than I thought. I planned out my routing here pretty well. Take a look at the spreadsheet I made. I spent a lot of time planning every last detail. Where would I get each Pokemon from? Where would I get each TM from? Are they purchasable? Can I find more than one of them? Where do I get the moves from? And if I were to make another team, I'd likely have to do some of these insane battle tower grinds or the Pokemon battle revolution grind. Like, yeah, I won't have to do the item grind again or the power item grind, but it's almost negated knowing I'd have to spend an equal amount of time to get like one trick room TM or 12 PP ups. All of this video, I've just been trying to show you the fully 100% legal way to get this team as fast as possible and prove to you that this is just not reasonable for any competitive game. In reality, many people who didn't hack probably took longer to build their teams and had weaker Pokemon than this. I think all of this can be summed up great by my favorite comment from my video on building the 2011 VGC World Championship team from Mosquito VGC. I share your opinion on hacking culture. The exhaustion and the wasted time on grinding, time that could have been spent practicing, 100% makes me understand why people hack, because we shouldn't have to spend dozens of hours just to begin to play. However, hacking is still an unfair advantage. If you hack while your opponent adhere to all the options and limitations the games provide, you now have the advantage of having more time to practice. You have violated the rules you agreed to when you signed up for the tournament, while your opponent didn't. But ultimately, the enemy isn't hackers for trying to avoid wasting their life on zero skill tedium. It's the single player RPG systems being applied to a multiplayer game. Game Freak has made so many advances in saving players times, Gen 8 felt relatively quick to train, and I hope Gen 9 eliminates the last of the barriers, because it still takes hours to train a team. Thank you for watching everyone, I'll see you next video. I want to do a big shout out to all of my channel members, thank you guys so much. Without your support, I couldn't be producing as many videos as I am, and I couldn't be streaming as often as I am, so it really means a lot to me. And special shout out to ShadowBliss56 and RLIZT, my Blist God tier members. Your generosity is unbelievable. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you all next video.